today, I want to talk about the fact that Peter said, when they were amazed by all this, and some people even mocked, and they thought, oh, they just had a little too much to drink, don't worry about it. Peter stands up and he says, no, 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 this is not inebriation you're looking at here. This is prophecy. This is, this is prophecy that is being fulfilled. And he begins to speak about the, the prophecy of Joel. Look with me again in your Bible at verse 16. He says here, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And he begins to, to quote that passage. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and, and, and so forth. And, and uh, he goes on and it, it kind of describes how that's going to happen. Now, the first couple of verses talk about how God's going to pour out his spirit on men and women, and they're going to prophesy and dream dreams, and it's going to be exciting, and, and people are going to be receiving supernatural works of the, of the spirit during that time. But the last two verses of this prophecy, you'll notice... Uh, talk about signs in the heavens and, and, and things like that. Wonders and signs and blood and fire and, and vapor of smoke. And it says the sun, verse 20, will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood and so forth. And when are these signs are, are supposed to take place? Well, he tells us at the very last part. He says, they're going to take place before the day of the Lord comes. He says, the great and magnificent day. Your Bible may say, the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's when these things are going to happen. So the prophecy of Joel that Peter is quoting here on the day of Pentecost, this first day when the Spirit falls upon the church, uh, has some elements that apply to this outpouring of the Spirit, but it also has some things that are yet future. And what that means is the prophecy of Joel is only partially fulfilled. There's more to come. For those of you who think that the Old Testament is just a bunch of Old Testament, just a bunch of prophecies that, that like applied way back before Christ, and there's really no reason to look into it, let me tell you right now, there's a huge prophetic part of the Old Testament that has yet to be fulfilled. This is one of the many passages where there is a partial fulfillment. It's an example of what we call the law of double reference. And what I mean by that is there is a part of this prophecy which has a short-term fulfillment, which Peter is citing at the time, but there are things that are yet to come. Notice that there wasn't any blood and fire and smoke and the moon didn't turn dark and, the, and, and red and, and those sorts of things. That's going to happen later on. It will be fulfilled later on when Christ comes. We've seen this many times. So it, wait, it awaits a complete fulfillment. But there's a statement that, that, that Peter makes in his quotation of this prophecy that's very interesting. And so that you and I can compare these statements, because he's quoting Joel here. I'm going to, first of all, put his statement on the screen so you can read it from Acts chapter 2. Let's, here, here's what it says. He's quoting, he says, he says, listen, this is what's in the book of Joel. And then he begins to quote it. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to put the actual quotation from Joel right underneath that so you can see, because there's some difference in wording. The actual passage in Joel says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I want you to notice what Peter says. Peter changes up the word slightly and begins with, uh, by saying, in the last days it shall be. So note the difference in the wording. So was Peter making a mistake here? Was he misquoting the book of Joel? I think not. I believe Peter is speaking as much under the inspiration of the Spirit as when Joel wrote the original prophecy. And what Peter is doing is he is speaking here, underscoring the fact that the day of Pentecost, that day, the day we read here in Acts chapter 2, begins a time period for you and I, which we call the last days. And the rest of Scripture confirms this. So when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church to empower it, this is really the inauguration of the church. What happened on that day? Well, the church was empowered. We know that because Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit falls on you. But something else happened. Click. A clicker got started. A, 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 a stopwatch, if you will. And we entered into a new age. We had been dealing with Israel up to this point. 
Up to this point, God's program, his prophetic program, his program of redemption centered around the nation of Israel. It's all about Israel. But something happens on the day of Pentecost. Boom! The Holy Spirit falls upon the church. Peter stands up and he says, this is a, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, which begins in the last days. And in so doing, Peter declares to you and I that with the inauguration of the church, we have entered into a new age. We are now in the last days. And we have been in the last days for 2,000 years. And the last days doesn't mean the last couple of days. It means a time period that is the last of what God is prophetically doing before Christ comes again. That's what the last days means, all right? It means it's the last event. This is the last cycle of the timetable of God's prophecy before the end. And when we talk about the end, you guys, we're not talking about, we're not like these weird people that walk around with signs, you know, all drugged up out on the streets going, it's the end of the world. Listen, when we talk about the end, you guys, we only refer to the end so there can be a new beginning. You guys know that there's going to come a new heaven and a new earth. God is going to recreate things. Sin has corrupted everything. God is going to recreate things after the last days. So right now, we're in the period that is referred to as the last days. And, and what's next on God's prophetic calendar? The coming of the Lord. First, he's going to come for the church. And the church is going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then he's going to come physically to the earth and he's going to fight for Israel because the nations of the world are going to come against her to destroy her. But let's, let me tell you something, you guys. We, we began that clock and, and Israel as a nation got set aside. The redemptive purposes of God, the prophetic purposes of God are just set aside in the church, or excuse me, in, in Israel, and now it's the church age, or the last days. And we are the focal point of what God is doing in the world right now. God is working through the church. That's what he's doing. I know it might not seem like the greatest thing in the world for him to do, but that's what he's doing. He's doing it in the church. But when the church is caught up and taken away, that's all over. And that clock that stopped at the inauguration of the church is going to start again when Israel is left upon the earth and the tribulation period begins while the church is, is, is caught away to be with uh, her bridegroom. So the, the next event is the coming of Jesus uh, to the earth. And, and, and so uh, here we are. We're in the last days. And I believe, as I've said before, uh, I believe we're in the last days of the last days. And I don't say that to say that we can set a time or date, and we're not going to be dumb, right? Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour, so we're not going to do that. That's, it's only spiritual pride that does it anyway. So we're not going there. But I'm simply saying that by, uh, by the way things look in this world, it's winding down. And the stage is being set for the tribulation period. Things that 50 years ago, 75 years ago, we had no idea how some of the prophecies concerning the tribulation could come true. We had no idea. 75 years ago, they were sitting there going, how in the world could you put some kind of a something on somebody whereby they would buy and sell? How in the world could you have a worldwide uh, economical market? They had no idea how that could happen. No idea. Now it's all in place. It's all in place for the coming of the Lord, for, to, to catch away the church, to begin the tribulation period, and then we have the beginning of the end, and then a new beginning. And I want to end with a passage from Revelation. I love the book of Revelation because it's so encouraging. At the end of the book of Revelation, God, it says that he will wipe every, uh, away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall... There be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. Why? For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. God is, he has a plan to, to remake the world in which we live because it's been corrupted by sin. 
This is, this is not the way God wants life to be for you and I, this life on earth. This is not fun. This is not enjoyable. People die every day. They die horribly and of horrible means, and that was never God's intention. And sin entering into the human race was never God's intention. So this is kind of an introduction, if you will, to Acts chapter 2.